hey, my brother's gone. He's gone? Yeah, like, for good. For good? Yeah, he, like, totally went back to Portland, and I'm all alone again. Wow. That was sudden. Um, not really. He, uh, so he was here only here for two months. Uh, after one month, he realized that unless you have some sort of college degree or some kind of vocational certification, that Pittsburgh isn't for you. And then, uh-huh. like, he spent another month figuring out how to go back home. So what does he do back in Oregon then that uh, he's able to do it without, without a degree? Uh, work at a bookstore. Aren't you going to do the intro? Oh, I thought that was your intro. This is the Draw Structure, episode 132, for August 9th, 2017. Big week to everyone listening. The show has notes. Visit the nexus.tv slash cs132 to see them. I'm your host, Steve Ordovis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. You sound like you're sliding around a lot. Sliding around? Yeah. In the tone, or I'm sliding around like where I'm at? Like, like you're, I'm like you're rubbing your fingers along something. Is that any better there? Maybe. My microphone possibly was rubbing against my shirt. Ah, uh, that, yeah, that might have been it. So, uh, how's things? Huh? Things are okay. Uh, enjoying the summer go by and not having it be super hot. Uh, yes. Growing, like cucumbers. Ah, and you've been doing lots of biking then. That sounds like a, a biking yes. Um, well, at least on the weekend, anyway. Uh, I must have did like 45 miles or so. But In uh, one day? Uh, no, uh, over two days. That's that's quite a bit still for two days. You'd be So did you come away sore or you, you conditioned to the point now where you, you can do it and you're not really sore the next day? Um, that and the fancy bike pants. <laughs> the fancy bike pants, okay. Yeah, so, um, it turns out that, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on downtown uh, over the weekend. So, uh, like the, uh, the Point State Park had, like, some kind of festival going on there. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm like, okay, well, there's this whole crowd of people. So once you like go around and see if you can, uh, you know, find some benches that aren't already taken. So I go on to like uh, the side that's facing the North Shore, and there's even more people there because Red Bull is like doing some kind of diving contest in the river. So like it's all crowded on this side. Uh, there's a ton of boats like right there in the river. Uh, there's, like, a platform going out into the river from the uh, North Shore, and, like, there's this sea of people over there, and I'm thinking, oh, crap, I'm not going to be able to ride on the trail right there. Is that the contest where they have, like, airplanes that people have built, and then glider airplanes, and they they push them off the platform into the water? Uh, maybe? Like, I didn't stick around long enough to, you know, watch what they were doing. I've seen YouTube videos of those before, and those are really fun fun to see. So, so uh, I managed to uh, slowly, uh, you know, wade through the uh, crowd there, and uh, then I came back. And this is Saturday, by the way. Okay. Uh, came back home. Uh, I had already, you know, got you know tons of meat out to thaw, and uh, grilled a whole bunch. Uh, took a shower. And ate way too much. <laughs> like, I felt sick. Uh, <laughs> because, like, that was, like, the first time I had eaten all day. Oh, um, uh, so you just ate too much because you're starved and famished. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I don't think I had a whole lot to eat Friday evening either. So uh, I stuffed myself so full that I skipped breakfast on Sunday. Uh, so... Then on Sunday, I did it all again, and uh, there was still a whole lot of people uh, downtown. And by the way, there was a Pirates game both days as well. So uh, the tea was, you know, you were kind of packed in like sardines. Mm. Uh, So, and then uh, remember how my uh, car was all broken? I don't remember that. That may be new. Okay. At least me to hear. So, uh, like, it was like way back in april or so that yeah there's 
my gear shift. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, so that only got fixed today. I thought you had like a something you unplugged something and it worked fine without it. Um not really like i tried to like splice in a wire to adjust the angles mm-hmm. and that worked for a grand total of a week oh, okay. just enough to get past inspection so <laughs> so um uh so for like four months i've been i've had the bezel on my gear shift popped off and uh i've been reaching my hand down to get the manual release uh every time i wanted to shift out of park uh, for like four months. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'd be glad to have that fixed then. Yeah. Um, and also the, uh, less importantly, uh, the speakers in the front doors didn't work and I got those, uh, replaced. Uh, but perhaps even more importantly than any of those, like, I can't recall what exactly it was, but you might know, like there was like some kind of ball joint in the uh, front passenger wheel Mm -hmm. that uh, like, I guess he said it was broken that uh, like the weight shifted around on the wheel a whole lot since this part was broken. So uh, like it was really starting to freak me out (laughs) because uh, like uh, if I turned onto the freeway that after once I hit about 40 miles, 40 miles an hour or so that uh, the, a uh, car would kind of jerk to the to the right, and I would have to compensate <laughs> for that in the steering. Okay, I, I I think I know what you're talking about there. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you got that one fixed. So yeah, because I I told the uh, the guy down at the shop that uh, you know like there's like some creaking going on in the in the front suspension that's making me really nervous, and uh, you know he called me back. He's like, well, I took it around. I didn't you know I didn't uh, feel anything. He's like. Did you get it up to about 40 miles an hour? It's like, well, I'll try it again. Uh, 15 minutes later, he uh, calls me back. He's like, yeah, I was swerving around, and yeah, <laughs> there's something going on. So, <laughs> so that, that's, that's good. Your car is safe now, and, uh, and so yeah. so yeah, uh, it's it uh, got fixed up enough to uh, go on a road trip uh, to go see the eclipse down south. Ah, where'd you go to? Or you're saying you will go to? I will go. Because that's in the future. There you I, go. I will I thought go. You're passive for a second. Yeah, I will go somewhere. Um, I'm going to wait until like three days before to get forecasts. Because like if I choose to say go to, I don't know, South Carolina or something, mm-hmm. like the weather will be like, no, you suck. And it'll like storm or something. So like I'll probably go to South Carolina Tennessee or maybe Illinois or so. Okay. I was, uh, one of my friends was telling me he's going out to Idaho to see it. They're actually having wow. a family reunion out there. That's kind of the reason why they're going. But anyways, uh, he was saying that currently, at least in Idaho, where that's at, uh, that they're planning on being sold out of food and everything, all the grocery stores, because there's just going to be so many people coming and the population is really small there. And so uh, that's something to keep in mind wherever you go that you may not be able to buy stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, pack all your stuff. So um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, biking. Got the car fixed. Um, so you uh, are you familiar with uh, Chris's Steve? Chris's Steve. I did hear that you have me as your Steve and that Chris has a Steve. Yes. I forget the other details as far as Chris's Steve, so, though. So I guess since you were coming over for the podcasts all the time that uh, he got uh, jealous and wanted his own Steve. <laughs> uh, the problem is that's his middle name and his real name is Dan. Oh, so, I see. So uh, if you remember once upon a time when I said my brother would be moving in with me. Uh huh. And did I ever mention that I had someone else maybe looking at moving in? I don't remember that. Okay, well, I've been trying to get Dan to come over to my place for about five months. And, you know, like, I was trying to get him to come over when my brother said he would move in with me. So, uh, it was, like, last week or so, last Wednesday, that he finally came over for the first time. So, came over as in to visit. Yes. 
and uh, you know, hey, would you like to uh, be my roomie? So uh, maybe I will have another roomie that might stick around for more than two months. There you go. Then you can have both the Steves. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> so, I have to fight another one. Yeah. Um, of course, I, I don't think I will tell Chris about him. <laughs> because a <laughs> um, uh, uh, funny story about that. But uh, anyway, uh, Dan uh, works in downtown but he lives like all the way out past New Stanton in Fayette County, which is like the next county over to the east. Oh, okay. I think. Um, so like he drives 50 miles into work and 50 miles back home. That's like me driving to work. Yeah. So that's <laughs> that's like an hour and a half at least each way. So, Maybe I'm a tiny bit further, but yeah, that's very comparable. So, um, and he works like 10 hour days. Oh dear. So, um, I'm like, yeah, so if you move in here, that means that's 10 minutes to walk down the hill and then like half an hour on the T and you're downtown. I'm sure he's going to appreciate that one. So, and so that saves on parking and like, that's got to be at least $20 of gas every day that he, that he would be saving. Yeah, that's. And that kind he, of a trip huge. And then he's like, oh, yeah, I take the turnpike, so that's, like, another, like, seven bucks. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. So, yeah, he, like, that'll be about $300 of savings a month. Plus, yeah. plus a lot of free time every day. He's not going to know what to do with himself. So, but uh, anyways, uh, if you've been uh, listening uh, to our conversations with Chris, that... Um, so I guess it was about a month ago now that uh, Chris signed uh, an apartment lease down in Washington. Mm -hmm. And um, so me and Zach are wondering, well, when is he going to move in there? You know, to like help him out and move him, move his stuff. He, so, he has the table in there already. So um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. We were sitting in church Thursday and like we were talking about this. And I was like, no, he hasn't said anything to me about it. So then, uh, like, Tiffany shows up. Uh, do you remember Tiffany? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, she's uh, been coming to church for, like, the past two months now. Like, she wasn't for, like, a long time. But she's coming, and I'm like, okay, um, where is Chris? Like, we're nervously looking around. We turn around. He's not there. Uh, he's not hiding behind me. Tiffany's here, so Chris has got to be here. So we ask, and she's like, well, he wasn't at his apartment when I left. It's like, his apartment? Like, did he move in? She's like, yeah, like, about a month ago. <laughs> and he didn't tell you? No. So he gets there, and we ask him, and he's like, yeah, I signed the lease a month ago. When are you moving in, Chris? I signed the lease a month ago. When are you moving in? That does not mean you moved in, Chris. That just means you signed a piece of paper. That does not mean you moved in. <laughs> so apparently he has a he has his bed, a table, a microwave, and that's about it. He's got to start. So I ask his dad on Sunday uh, about it. You know, like uh, you know, when has Chris moved out yet? And he's like, oh, "That's a topic of ongoing discussion." <laughs> <laughs> so apparently as of last Sunday he still had quite a bit of stuff at his parents place so uh, apparently his dad said that you know Chris called him and said it's like okay I'm gonna be there Saturday night uh, Sunday night or no 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 wait uh, Friday night and Sunday night or something and I'm like so you're still charging him rent for this right so, um, yeah, I'm not sure what Chris's problem is. Like, it, once I moved out of my parents' place, like, I was very thankful for it. So, like, I'm not sure what his problem is, you know? I don't know. I did help him, actually, with uh, the table. I had been down on some Wednesday night, I and I think it was the day he signed the lease, I want to say. It was, like, that day or the day after, and I helped him uh, hmm. transport a table with my truck. And, uh... Oh yeah. oh yeah, you mentioned uh, something about the couch. 
Uh, yeah, I was you saying about something to crash. That would be something we could uh, maybe find a couch at like a thrift store or something and throw it in the back way. Chuck can take it down sometime. <laughs> well, there's that. And uh, I asked, you know, at least me and Zach asked, uh, are your floors clean? Because that's all you really need. You know, like bring over like, uh, oh, bring over the blanket that Chris always likes to use. And go. sleep on that. <laughs> that would work. So, and I guess you're not going to be in town this uh, Sunday? Not this Sunday. Okay. I'm actually going to be in town Wednesday night. I had church before that. Then Thursday night, I have to drive back up because we're going, going to leave on vacation because uh, it's a Friday off. So wait, why would you come all the way? A, why would you come all the way down here for church? No, my church is on Wednesday night, so I have to go to church on Wednesday night, and then I have to drive down, work in the office on Thursday, and oh. then I have to drive all the way back up so we can go to, go on vacation. So, uh, can we look forward to seeing you sometime? Probably not that trip. Uh, the sometime will likely be in the future when we start actually sprinting which I, I, I see as a few weeks few weeks out, probably. Ah. But maybe be a few um, weeks. You okay, see you're a lot like of breaking up really bad. At some point. Okay, what, what part? Like all of it. Is somebody uploading? So thank you, Windows. So anyways, I was saying I'll probably be down eventually at some point in time when my team starts actually sprinting. And quite possibly when we start sprinting, I may or may not be down for multiple days. We see how that one goes. Uh, so, anyways, I uh, remember all of Garden. I do. I apparently they sent him an email and they're like, "You're using our trademark, and we're going to sue you. You should stop using this. You should take your site down, even your domain name." And they're giving them a hard time about that. So, um, in poem form, I'm not exactly sure which form of poem this is. Like. The guy, you know, says that everything's okay, uh, says, yes, an official who represents Darden has granted me a total pardon. We've reached a resolution. <laughs> I received absolu absolution for daring to print all of Garden. I like the, the email that they sent him. They had a screenshot of it there. And it sounded like the, the guy that emailed him was really nice to do <laughs> him and even gave him a, a $50 gift card, which I thought was a good gesture for a company when, like, they kind of made a mistake. Uh -huh. And they they turned around, took responsibility for it, and, and were good natured about it. Yeah, totally. So, and now for this episode's lol, Microsoft. <laughs> so it turns out that Microsoft loves Paint, like the program that's been around in Windows since like ever. Uh, there was a scare that I was trying to bundle. What's was that? it bundled with Windows One? I was, I was trying to decide, was it bundled with Windows 1? Maybe, th I know probably Windows 3, maybe 3.1. I know 3.1 had it. Yeah, if if not earlier, but yeah, definitely from 3.1. Uh, there was recently a scare that it would be discontinued from Windows. Uh, it turns out that it's just moving to the Windows Store. Because, like, there's a thing called Paint 3D coming. I, I saw that in the, the store, like... It showed, like, these pictures of someone had, like, a, a floating island in the sky and like a was smiley. drawing a dinosaur. So, yeah, I'm not exactly sure, uh, like, how that will take off because, like, paint was, like, kind of simple in 2D. And, like, lots of uh, office monkeys used it to, uh, like, paste screenshots and stuff and uh, would encode their uh, screenshots of their UI in JPEG and totally make everything look like a poop smear. <laughs> I remember how funny the pictures look when you change the the, the bytes burned. Yeah. I did find, I was Googling to see Windows 1, I did find a uh, Windows Paint version. Ah, let's see here. It wasn't originally developed by Microsoft, but instead it was licensed by ZSoft Corporation's PC Paintbrush. In the first version of Windows, released in 1985, Paint only supported one bit monochrome graphics. Later, it was superseded by Paintbrush in Windows 3 uh, with color support and a redesigned user interface. And uh, yeah. we'll be putting that in the show notes. So, we'll be, uh, that one. 
Yes, and uh, also uh, Lazy Game Reviews uh, posted a paint retrospective that pretty much goes through Ooh. all of that. That sounds like that would be fun to watch. Yes. I like history like that. It's kind of neat. So, uh, something else that's history uh, is Flash. Shall we have a moment of silence? Uh, not really, because it's not 2020 yet. Okay. In 2020, we have to have a moment of silence for Flash. Yes. So, um, you know that uh, insecure browser plugin that was, you know, really the hotness back, say, 15 years ago? Yeah, uh, the one that's always needing updated and always has vulnerabilities? Uh, yeah, that one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Adobe has announced plans to, uh, you know, completely kill off Flash, uh, which... You know, at this point, you know, like, there's so much interesting stuff that uses Flash that uh, will probably never be updated to anything else. So I'm kind of sad that, you know, we're going to lose like direct history like this. But, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, it's it's time to, you know, kill the uh, kill it off and move forward. Yeah, it does make sense. That's kind of like what you were saying as soon as I saw that. I was thinking about some of the Flash games that you know I used to play when I was younger and had fun with and have saved away in a file someplace. And I'm like, so if the modern browsers, Firefox, they're planning on supporting an offshoot branch uh, for till 2020, but their main branch, I believe, is the next year they're killing it? Soon. Uh, but that means even past 2020, you need to go pull an old, an old browser to actually uh, make use of any games. Yeah, I'll probably... Uh add that to a virtual machine somewhere, you know, probably in, in Windows XP. There you go. XP still lives. Go XP. So, uh, hey, speaking about Firefox and uh, Flash, uh, they've published a roadmap uh, about this. So uh, says that Flash will be disabled by default for most users in 2019, and only users running the extended support release will continue using Flash through the final end of life at the end of 2020. It's nice that they kind of lay it out when they're going to do it, and it sounds like they're working with Adobe on that one. Yep. So uh, AMD Threadripper has been delidded. Turns out that it's actually an Epic chip, uh, one that was probably defective in some way, so they turned off half the dies. Uh, So, uh, like, if you remember, uh, Epic is the, uh, like, monstrous, uh, like, what, 32-core uh, uh, processor that they're uh, using. It's essentially mm-hmm. four uh, Ryzen chips uh, that's like all on a single package. And it turns out that Threadripper is that, but with half of it turned off. Uh, so, so, so this is somewhat like the uh, tri-core CPUs that used to be a thing that you could buy. And you could sometimes turn on the extra core. Uh, hey, a uh, triple core CPU. I have one of those in the basement. It used to be. It used to power the Andrew Bailey dot com. Oh. Um, so, uh, and yes, I did get one of those motherboards that advertised, you know, the feature of you know turning on the extra core, but I was never able to do that. My brother had a system once that had the tri core, and he did turn it on. I do believe it did function. Uh, I forget if stability was an issue or not. But I do know that it, it did function with it turned on. So, so you know, with, uh, you know, whenever, you know, the silicon wafer goes through the uh, the fabricator, that, uh, you know, there are some defects. And it turns out that you don't really know what and where the defects are until you assemble it all into the package. Then, you know, realize that, oh, this core totally doesn't work. Um, so then, like, it has to be turned off in other ways. Like, sometime, well, sometimes, often, by, like, actually getting out a laser and cutting, uh, like, the little wires to, like, actually completely sever it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's still, like, you know, otherwise the same-looking package. Uh, but uh, some of it's just disabled, but it runs really well. It's a nice concept that they have a way to recycle uh, their manufacturing mistakes and so get... Uh income out of it yeah that way it can make the products overall cheaper yeah and uh with the proliferation of uh multi-core cpus uh i think that's gotten a lot easier Mm, that's true 
So Ryzen, and presumably the entire Zen architecture, is vulnerable to seg faulting under easily triggered conditions. Uh, so, what is a, well, I was going to ask, what's a seg fault? Uh, segmentation fault. You know what those are, right? I'm trying to think. I recognize it, but I don't can't see what it is. Is that something with the memory, like the something like that? Yeah. Um, like I'm, I'm surprised you haven't uh, encountered encountered anything like that, especially on Linux. Like out, like I, I remember several times, like you know, running some kind of command, and like it, it won't do anything, and then the console will just say seg fault. Yeah. Or a so segmentation it, fault at whatever. So I have seen it before, but it wasn't in Linux. So it says, seg faults are caused by a program trying to read or write an illegal memory location. Yeah. Uh, and so where I've seen that before is actually Windows 98 telling me that someone was trying to write the memory that wasn't allowed. <laughs> I think so, I used to get that a lot in the one system. <laughs> so uh, it looks like this is caused by pegging the CPU to 100% and filling up the memory. Hmm. And so it just kind of locks up and everything starts throwing the error out a whole bunch of times. Yeah. That could be a serious issue. So yeah, I I did find what I believe to be a hardware issue with Ryzen related to concurrent operations. In a nutshell, for any given hyperthread pair, if one hyperthread is in a CPU-bound loop of any kind and the other is returning uh, from an interrupt via... I R E T Q. The other, uh, so yeah, the hyperthread issuing the I R E T Q can stall indefinitely until the other hyperthread with the CPU bound loop pauses. Hmm. After this situation occurs, the system appears to destabilize. So it looks like uh, that was like posted on like a free BSD mailing list, uh, and then uh, Pharonix, uh looks to test it uh, as well. And it looks like they're uh, doing that in, in Ubuntu. So, yeah. Again, like I sort of uh, knew that uh, this was, uh, you know, Ryzen was sort of like a, you know, like a not properly cooked platform. And I, I decided that I was okay with that. Mm -hmm. So Sometimes you, you get, get things like that, the cost of, uh, cost, cost of being first. Yes, I, I paid my AMD tax. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, uh, so do we think that uh, a bug like this is going to be fixable with like a motherboard patch? Or is that likely just going to be an issue with these then? Uh, usually things like these are uh, specifically microcode patches, uh, which are delivered through the uh, BIOS updates. Okay. So, so. Uh, side note, um, remember all those crashes that I mentioned that I had? Uh, moving to, to the new BIOS. Well, apparently I've read that if I disable the, I think it's called the C6 sleep state, uh, that uh, those might go away. So I might try to uh, reflash uh, to that uh, hmm. revision and try again. Sounds worth a try. Uh, but uh, let's say you're completely tired of uh, Ryzen's shenanigans and you decide that it's a completely broken platform. Uh, and you decide to go to the power architecture. Uh, it's IBM's line of high-end CPUs. Uh, it's sort of related to PowerPC. Uh, there was sort of a developer system released quite a while ago. Uh, it was it was probably successful enough that it warranted an upgrade to Power 9. Talos 2 is uh, like the next upgrade to that. Uh, and it's available per, for pre-order, uh, shipping by the end of the year. So, you know, you know, being a uh, like a power CPU, this is like sort of like an exotic, sort of uh, like a mainframe-ish CPU. That's what I was wondering. You're saying it's a different architecture, so it's going to be limited in in usefulness to normal so, people. So, in other words, you're not going to run Windows on it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not an x86 at all. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Talos 2 drives the state of the art uh, of secure computing forward. Talos 2 gives you and only you full control of your machine security. Uh, rest assured knowing that only your authorized software and firmware are running via Power9's secure boot features. 
Don't trust us? Look at the secure boot sources yourself and modify them as you wish. That's the power of Talos 2. <laughs> so Definitely. along along with uh, like the security uh, features, it's also the first system with PCI Express 4.0. So, so can you get any PCI Express 4.0 cards? <laughs> um, probably. Uh, usually graphics cards are usually the first to support that. Wow, oh, okay. Uh, even though the, uh, uh, how should I say, efficiency of doing so uh, pretty much went away uh, after PCIe 2. Um, so, like, I took a look at these, and it looks like an E-ATX motherboard with dual quad cores uh, with at least four-way SMT uh, with heat sinks goes for less than $3,000. If you want your own personal mini supercomputer, there you go. So, uh, and if you, uh, like, want pretty much a whole box, uh, that'll be $6,350. So, you know, considering that, uh, you know, this is kind of like a, like a mainframe grade machine, I don't think it's that bad of a price. Yeah, not really, because that's, I mean, that's reachable for someone that if they had something they wanted to try and they felt like they needed to use that, that's reachable for a normal person to attain to if they, if they really, really thought that that was something they needed. Yeah, like, uh, if it's someone, so, if, uh, how should I say this? If like a bank or something uh, was like doing development for their mainframe or something, mm -hmm. and like there was like one of these boxes somewhere that they could actually test stuff on, uh, like you know that would like be an ideal situation for that. Yes, that would be nothing to a bank to get another test system for that much money. So, so uh, a four-way SMT. So like you know, hey, we mentioned hyperthreading earlier, uh, which is you know. Uh, how should I say, Intel's way of like doing multiple threads on one processor core. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of doing two threads on one processor core, imagine four. Um, and I wasn't able to uh, get like the, per the precise specification on any of these CPUs in these systems, uh, but apparently Power 9 uh, has support for up to eight. So somewhere between four and eight. Hmm. And apparently it can scale dynamically. So like if one thread is using more resources, like it will dynamically scale down and say like, oh, like this, this CPU is like really busy over here. It can only accept three threads right now or something. So, yeah, it turns out that Linux works pretty well on these power based systems. You might even run a UI like GNOME on it. Here's a brief history of GNOME in general. That was a really good uh, presentation about it, just like going through the history. Almost uh, broader than GNOME, some, a little bit of distros and, and Linux history in there too. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I stumbled across this, and uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. So mm -hmm. like it sort of like goes uh, like specifically with GNOME, but also you know things like Windows, like how, how the competition influenced it. And uh, like even uh, KDE as well. Yep, and just uh, come kind of the flow of flow of time. Starting at, at Linux, where uh, Linus posts that I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby. We'll be big and professional like G and U. So, uh, and then like your other quote there. Ah uh, yes, the other one. This is talking later versions. It's like from here on out, GNOME only removes features, and that was the after I think they said that they had four different clocks in the system and users are confused about how to tell time because there's just too many clocks and yeah and too much confusion going on yeah that's uh under the uh year 2000 uh slide with gnome 1.4 it was interesting just going back through and looking at them i actually recognized a good bit of the the older versions and i remember the way way old ones seeing gnome and kind of not really liking it because it just i thought it looked ugly and it didn't look very polished uh-huh. And, like, compared to Windows at the time, Windows was way, way more polished. Uh, but now, I mean, like, I'm using GNOME right now because uh, I, I switched over from Unity because Unity wasn't working for uh, my slicer. Mm -hmm. And GNOME works really good now. Like, it's not... Even the previous version, like, I didn't like that very much, but I like this version of GNOME. Like, it's good for me. Like, I like it. 
Yeah, pretty much this, uh, by the time Ubuntu came along, like GNOME was pretty good as a UI. Like, it, yeah, it worked. It just was different. I didn't like the style at that time, but it wasn't ugly anymore. Uh, well, all, like all the brown stuff uh, initially in Ubuntu was uh, uh, yeah. kind of bland looking, I guess. I guess it was too close to beige. Yeah. I don't like the men- menus initially at the top. That was kind of a big one with me, just the way they, they laid it out and they did the menus. I just wasn't wasn't a fan of them. Yeah, uh, I guess they did that to distinguish themselves by uh, like not having anything like a start menu. Yeah, which I did distinguish them. Uh, but, you know, it, I don't think it was ever meant to be like super pretty, just like attractive looking at least. So... Yeah, it was definitely a simplistic feel that you got from it back when they just had that the menu at the top. Yeah, and uh, you also pointed out uh, the other thing there. Uh, the, the group on attack. I just saw that you found the article about it and was starting to scan it. Uh, it you, did you want to summarize what it what it was? So, so uh, uh, in one of the slides there, it mentions uh, an attack from Groupon, which. Uh, you know, kind of was random to me. Uh, but I think I vaguely remember this now that uh, I uh, did a DuckDuckGo sh- search on it. Uh, so uh, once upon a time about, uh, let's see, 2014, that uh, you know what Groupon is, right? It came to mind, is it like a online coupon place? Am I totally wrong? Something like that, yeah. So it's kind of like a sort of like a social network for companies that, uh, you know, they'll put like some kind of deal on there to get people in. Mm. Uh, but uh, anyways, they wanted to distribute what is what is essentially a fancy cash register and they wanted to call it Gnome, which, uh, uh, you know, obviously conflicted with the uh, Linux UI. Uh, but uh, they uh, Groupon wanted to uh, file trademarks for it. So uh, eventually, uh, after some fighting on the behalf of the uh, Gnome Foundation, I think, uh, Groupon gave up. I'm not sure mm. if uh, the Gnome Foundation ever went and filed a trademark for themselves or not. I'm getting the feeling that they realized that there is going to be a lot of people angry at them if they push forward. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, don't mess with the Linux people. Yeah, because we run all of your things. Exactly. So uh, our good buddy Troy Hunt uh, reviews authentication procedures. And, uh, you know, he starts off with, you know, the password was, you know, pretty much the uh, go-to method in, say, the 1960s, uh, but has not exactly held up, held up too well. It's kind of, there's been a lot of myths built around passwords and best practices around them that uh, aren't always the way that they, they think they should be. This one really common annoying one that I found hit a lot is uh, banks when they think that you shouldn't use a password manager, and so they disable copy and paste. Yeah. <sighs> so uh, there's there's that there's uh, you know the character set limitation the char- uh so then uh, like I think he goes over the uh, NIST guidelines for passwords, uh, which which are uh, actually pretty good. Yeah. So, uh, all printing ASCII characters as well as the space character should be acceptable in memorized secrets. Unicode characters should be accepted as well. Uh, and then I, then I really like this. If someone really wants to have a password that's an emoji representation of the first verse of Let It Go, good on them. <laughs> no one's ever going to guess that. She's a double four! <laughs> Sorry, uh, my... <laughs> I just I I don't I haven't had a whole lot of Chris in my life, so I need to you know emulate it in some way. Uh, going on, verifiers should not impose other composition rules like requiring mixtures of different character types or prohibiting consecutively repeated characters for memorized secrets. Uh, let's see. We Did... talked about the the password change rules too where they force you to change the password every so many days and how that promotes us to just change the password and 
add a different number to the end or in increment a number someplace in the password. So um, next time password day comes around at my company, I'm going to be uh, emailing some people uh, like, you know, like articles and research saying that, mm -hmm. you know, regularly changing passwords is a bad thing. What's uh, interesting is you're saying how Microsoft has their online service at least realized that that's a thing but we still have it in the operating system and uh, currently Microsoft doesn't give good guidelines. It seems to be just a standard, like everyone well, thinks that's, that's the way it is. Well, um, it's not the Windows that forces you to change your password. It's a uh, domain policy. group policy, yeah. Yes, but I, I guess what I'm getting at is they've allowed that setting to be there, whether it was a default at some point in time or why, but somehow it became the de facto standard that just everyone always turns on. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> oh yeah. And, uh, it wasn't the, uh, the bank that, uh, uh, tweeted out that password managers were bad. It was an airline. Hi, we do not advise on a password manager in case the device gets compromised. So I'll just use my sticky note instead and put yep. it on my monitor. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, let them paste passwords and stuff. Do not mandate regular password changes. Uh, only ask users to change their passwords on indication or suspicion of compromise. So, uh, yeah, then notify users of uh, abnormal behavior. And the most important part, block previously breached passwords. This was kind of a, you know, sort of a sticking point to me. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, um... How are we supposed to get the lists without being branded as some kind of criminal? So uh, uh, Troy Hunt has uh, helpfully uh, provided a list of 306 million SHA-1 hashed passwords that have been leaked. So you can use this uh, list and uh, you know any passwords that come in, you can uh, hash them to SHA-1. And see if they're in the list. And if they're in the list, chances are it's been compromised before. Mm -hmm. And you can tell your user to not use this. That's a really good idea. I've never seen a website that does it that way. But that just makes a whole lot of sense. Yes. So, yeah, this is a tremendous resource. Yes. So, um, let's see. I'm not sure how to... Uh, like transition into this next topic, so I'm not going to. But on Linux, it turns out that telling time is slow, at least compared to Windows. Unfortunately, Windows did win on this one. <laughs> yeah, like by a lot. Yeah, so what is that? What is the difference here? So when you ask it, uh, this is so when you're asking the operating system through Java, this is a Java thing. When you're asking it through Java, what the current time is, it currently takes. Uh, Windows around four less nanoseconds, than, less, less than four. Yeah, less than four nanoseconds. Less than four. Linux, six hundred and fifty-ish nanoseconds. Yeah, which that's pretty big time factor there. So uh, on Windows, uh, it's been designed pretty well in that the uh, the call is not a system call, so it, like stays entirely within user space. And then it gets like a like the high portion of uh, the time, then a low portion of the time, then it gets the high portion again and compares did the high portion stay the same, and then it returns it if it matches. And then on Linux, it does something weird that um, apparently like some high resolution timer uh, kind of sticks around and waits a lot. They were saying that that timer was actually more higher resolution than could be read anyways, and so it wasn't even quite... Necessary. Yeah, necessary. But like I said in the article, maybe someday we will want that kind of precision. You never know. Yeah, like down to the atto second or something? Yeah, or something like that. Which, but, is, which I don't know, is like a trillionth or something, or a quadrillionth of a second? I don't know, but when, when we get the quantum computing down pat, I think we would need that. Yeah. So uh, it was interesting, though. He did have a fix uh, 
to change it, he was saying, uh, it's just, apparently there's a configuration you can change, and it's just like a temporary to the system reboots, but you could uh, set it for a different type of timer to be used, and it actually wouldn't then make it fast. So it's not that you're stuck if you have an application that has a lot of calls mm-hmm. to the timer. He did a very good job in this article, just yeah. like... Which which uh, gets it down to about 36 nanoseconds. Mm-hmm. Which is then comparable when you're talking that small of a size. Yeah, which, um, like, I calculated this out, and, uh, like, 650 nanoseconds, uh, like, I'm thinking in terms of, like, a like a video game or, like, graphics redrawing. Uh, so, uh, like, at 60 frames per second, uh, 650 nanoseconds is 3% of a frame. That's how long it takes, like, 3% of, like, an entire image at 60 hertz to get out. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're trying to, like, time how fast your graphics routine is, it's like, well, that's 3% just gone because you wanted to know what time it was. That's always the problem of of measuring measuring time in an application. So, but if it's, say, 3 nanoseconds, okay, that's fine. Mm Mm-hmm. It was the interesting, uh, I'll see if I can find it here, at the beginning of the article, it talked about the number of times you could call the function in Windows versus in Linux. It was quite a big difference. It just shows how much it matters over the course of a second. Let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, like 200 times slower or something? Well, I was just saying the number of times in, within a second they were saying it could be called. Ah. Uh, someplace, such a big article. Let's see. Reduce the iteration count by a few zeros. Average query time in Linux is 640 nanoseconds, which is more than half a microsecond. We can only execute this call 1.5 million times per second. There you go. And then the Windows one is the the counter to that one. That's... Yeah, we, we can query time 260 million times per second. That's, that's a significant difference. It's virtually free. So, Until yeah. quantum computing. <laughs> well, even then, maybe not. Maybe not. So I would uh, like to appreciate uh, Google Hangouts. So uh, we've this uh, this podcasting network uh, uses Google Hangouts like frequently, and I think has since pretty much the beginning. Uh, so uh, the uh, how should I say this? So like whenever I w- I was sitting at my you know, whenever I'm sitting at my desk here at home, that apparently right in front of the monitors, like pretty much all around the desk, the signal to my cell phone is pretty weak. So like uh, a few times my mom had called me and like it didn't ring, so I didn't pick up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like we, how should I say this? I eventually conned her into, uh, you know, getting to use Hangouts. And uh, with that, you know, it goes over the Wi-Fi, so it's pretty good. The uh, Wi-Fi signal uh, apparently is strong enough, and you know, right in front, you know, and along my desk, that uh, like it can still do it. I know it's, I know it's nice. I like their integration with Google Voice. Uh, coming over from you remember back when it was Grand Central years ago? Not quite. It was. It used to be a company called Grand Central, and then they got bought by Google, and. Uh, Initially, it was, you know, you get your free phone number and forwards to phones and stuff, and they've just nicely integrated it with the Google Hangouts app and uh, allow you to text and call and stuff through your, your Google Voice number. It's a really, really nice thing. So, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, and, uh, like, we were both amazed that uh, the call quality, like the sound, is so much better on Hangouts. Versus your, your phone. Yeah, like the regular POTS stuff. So, yeah. And, uh, let's see. Oh, I totally forgot. So, uh, yeah, I was out uh, in Kansas City and, uh, you know, with the uh, with the company Town Hall. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, uh, let's see, I want to thank all of my listeners listening from uh, the greater Kansas City metropolitan area, uh, especially you, Chris the other Chris. The like, Utah there's, Chris. There's like five of them out in Kansas City. It's nuts. 
So, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I may have uh, mentioned this podcast to one of them. See, you might actually have listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, if you would like to uh, submit feedback uh, for the show, please do so on the Nexus.tv. Uh, right below our pretty faces on the uh, show notes page. Uh, so, yeah, we'll probably read them on the air if they're interesting. Uh, and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your podcasts and everything else. Uh, maybe to your uh, Power 9 server or something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a, a solar eclipse is coming up, so uh, I'll I'm hopefully I will uh, plan out a road trip appropriately to see that. Mm-hmm. So have you bought your classes and everything, and so that you can watch it. Um, let's see. I believe there's going to be uh, glasses for everyone being sent to the office. So if uh-huh. they're there ahead of time, I'll probably just grab one of those. So yeah, it'll be uh, very surreal to have the uh, sun just blink out for like two minutes. Hmm. It's going to be a pretty neat thing. Hopefully it'll be uh, uh, still somewhat viewable from right here. From what I read, it sounded like it. You still kind of could see it. It just wasn't as nice, and it yeah. was all the way. Yeah, so you you actually have to go, go to a certain strip of land uh, in order to get it all the way. You see someone currently mapped out like who voted for who in that strip of land. And apparently it was all Republican. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. It was really funny. But yeah, so have have fun with your your solar eclipse and uh, seeing it. Hopefully you you don't have too many people on the road all traveling around and make it too busy. Or melt. Or melt in the heat heat from going down south. Yeah, I guess that's it for now. So have a good one. You too.